Good evening, my name is Joyce Kennedy and I'm the Senior Director of Community Relations here at Concordia College and on behalf of the college, welcome to all of you tonight to our spring Jacobson Global Lecture Series. So now without further ado, I'd like to introduce our president, John Nunes, who will get up and introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you very much. Good evening, and thank you, Joyce, for all the work you do to support this series and for the effort you put in to promote the event here this evening. Join me, please, in thanking Joyce Kennedy for her work. The Jacobson Global Lecture Series has contributed to the conversations at Concordia for 28 years now, created by David Jacobson, a former provost and professor of philosophy here at Concordia. This series brings to our campus distinguished speakers who intellectually inspire us and motivate us in the realm of ideas. When Dr. Jacobson passed in 2004, his family and friends joined his wife, Kate Kors Jacobson, in underwriting this series in order to keep Dr. Jacobson's legacy alive. Kate is with us this evening. Kate, could you please stand and be recognized? Thank you, Kate. Tonight, we again welcome to campus and to the Bronxville community a distinguished speaker, J. Christopher Giancarlo, the chairman of the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission. The mission of the CFTC is to foster open, transparent, competitive, and financially sound markets for products regulated under the Commodity Exchange Act of 1936. Has anyone heard of Dodd-Frank? Since Dodd-Frank passed in 2010, this now includes the multi-trillion dollar swaps market, from crops to copper and interest rates to swaps. Chris and his 800-person team at the CFTC are responsible for overseeing all of these markets. I listened to some YouTube videos of him this weekend, and from the wee bit that I was able to understand, if we have some time during the Q&A, someone should ask Chris about uh, whether or not Bitcoin is real currency. He is a lawyer, has extensive experience in private practice, corporate, and international law, including working in London for several years. He is an expert on public policy and technology involving the financial markets and testified before Congress several times regarding the Dodd-Frank Act. Joining Chris tonight are his mom, Ella. Welcome, Ella. And with red socks on, I get it, his son Luke. Welcome, Luke. I also happened to take a look at Chris's Twitter page. And I learned that he, I learned some things about him. Would you like to know what I learned? Yeah, he is an accomplished banjo and guitar player. I also learned that he owns a 1973 original condition Buick convertible. And I'm sure that that car takes a lot of oil and gas commodities to keep it running smoothly. So I guess Chris is in the right job. Please join me in welcoming CFTC Chairman Chris Giancarlo. Wow, that is a warm-up. Thank you so much. That is awfully kind and, uh, and energizing. I feel very, very energized, and I've been so excited about this lecture. Um, I've been thinking a lot about it and, and what I would talk to uh, your wonderful faculty and students about tonight, 
And so I am as excited um, uh, to tell you, uh, to talk about the things I want to talk about tonight. It is an honor to come here to Concordia. This is a great school with st sound scholarship, a spiritual tradition, and clearly passionate, outstanding faculty and students. Your emphasis on individual responsibility, the liberal arts, science, and public service make Concordia an exciting, inspirational place to be. It's also a privilege to be the latest lecturer in this distinguished 28-year series, named for your husband, the late David Jacobson, provost and legendary professor of philosophy. His memory remains. His person lingers. Tonight, in honor of Dr. Jacobson, we turn to a philosopher that he knew well, John Stuart Mill, the proponent of act utilitarianism, which is to do that act which will create the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest number of people. Dr. Jacobson had much to say about Mill and utilitarianism, but we'll turn to that later. I want to turn to his virtually unknown side of John Stuart Mill, and that is his employment by the East India Company. 200 years ago, one of the most extensive and profitable concerns in the world was the East India Company headquartered in London. The company was involved in commerce, trade, developing markets, and territorial acquisition throughout the world, with most of its trade focused on the Indian subcontinent. The company was multinational, powerful, and global, long before the phrase globalization had come into common usage. The East India Company was a closed private corporation controlled by a small select few and selling stock only to its existing members. Yet the, the company also advanced official British interests to the point where the interests of Britain and the company's shareholders were intertwined. They were often one and the same and the British government followed the East India Company into India. Not coincidentally, the East India Company was granted exclusivity over its markets, what we might call today a monopoly, with control and full oversight. They were labeled by one historian as both regulatory body and sole operator, overseeing markets for their trade and having that virtual monopoly over them. Their corporate structure was, in the words of that same historian, quote, a halfway stage in the evolution of the medieval guild into today's public limited company. In short, because of its profitability and contribution to the economy through trade and taxation, the East India Company was both private and public, a business and a quasi-government, and often unaccountable to anyone other than itself. You may know some of its infamous history, which included some of the worst excesses of imperialism and conquest. And as I said, it was self-regulating over its own affairs. Now, it's of interest to me because the trade involved commodities and the use of very sophisticated derivative structures in financing, long before we used that term, derivatives. In 1823, John Stuart Mill joined the East India Company and was employed there from 1850, uh, until 1858, a total of 35 years. Now, while much has been wit written of John Stuart Mill's work on utilitarianism, mostly developing the ideas of his father, James Mill, and Jeremy Bentham, almost nothing has been written about John Stuart Mill's time at the East India Company. While there, while he was there, he became one of the foremost voices for economic and judicial reform, women's rights, and universal, universal suffrage. But while he was there, Mill, the businessman, Mill, the market regulator, Mill, the man of empire, we know virtually nothing. Think about the possibilities of this for a second. What if philosophers ran Fortune 500 companies, regulatory agencies, or central banks. Imagine if Socrates 
had conducted internal audit of KPMG or Goldman Sachs? What if Simone de Beauvoir was governor of the Federal Reserve? And what if St. Thomas Aquinas had my job running the Commodity Futures Trading Commission? Well, philosopher John Stuart Mill had a job like that. He handled external com communications for one of the 19th century's major global companies. He, and it allowed him the opportunity to influence decisions through his utilitarian calculations, his utilitarian philosophy. Now, I mentioned Mill for two reasons. He brought philosophy to his work. And he allowed philosophy to be an inconsistent check on his company's exploitation of native populations. But also, somewhat surprisingly, he allowed it to be a more consistent influence on market needs, profitability, wealth creation, trade, and other actions that brought something of the greatest good to the greatest number of people. So clearly, philosophy matters. And that's why we're here. As Dr. Jacobson reminded us, there's more than one theory of ethics. There's Platonic forms, Old Testament ethics, Stoicism, Christian ethics, the categorical imperative, Moore's goodness as self-evident symbols, and of course, Marxism, and social justice, and justice as fairness, and liberation theology, and community norms, and relativism, among other things. But philosophy also exists in government. And Dr. Jack, uh, Jacobson asked to apply those ethics to make the world better through our decisions and actions. Or as another philosopher, philosopher much read on this campus, Reinhold Niebuhr called it political wisdom. Now, as a lawyer, a former business executive, and now a regulator, I find fascinating the scope of activities of the East India Company and its head of communications, John Stuart Mill. But I also know that a business should not serve the role of government in the way it did. The work of the East India Company will always be haunted by secrecy, greed, unseemly enrichment, and ultimately failure, closing its doors in 1874. We've also learned over time that regulators themselves should not run the business they are regulating or be captured by them. It's appropriate that there be a proper zone of separation between business and government. Now, speaking of government, in the United States, we often concentrate on the three branches of government, the president, the Congress, and our courts. But there's more to the federal government system. For example, we have administrative agencies to regulate commercial activity, starting in the late 1800s with the creation of the Interstate Commerce Commission. The agencies prescribe what may or may not be done, determine whether the law has been violated in particular cases, and proceed against violators to impose fines or take other actions. These types of agencies are called regulatory agencies because they deal with the private rights of indiv individuals and regulate the manner in which those rights may be exercised. These agencies have been delegated both legislative and judicial powers, and they often have power over licensing, rate making, business practices, and other things. And then there are those agencies that exist outside the federal executive departments and are considered independent agencies because the president's power to dismiss the agency head or commissioners is limited. The independent commission structure is designed to insulate the agency from the political winds that often swirl around Washington. The most well-known independent agencies are the Federal Reserve Board, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the Federal Communications Commission. In my case, I'm the chairman of a less well-known independent federal agency, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, known as the CFTC. The CFTC was established to be a legal and moral authority over markets in a way that would counter expediency or short-sighted politics. We operate under the Commodities Exchange Act, 
which President Nunes said, pointed out was passed in 1936. The law has been amended many times since then, and it establishes the statutory framework under which our agency operates, both judicial and legislative. The agency is composed of five commissioners, all chosen by the President and confirmed by the U.S. Senate. No more than three of our five commissioners can be of the same political party as the President. The commission is a creation of Congress, which has delegated power to us. And the delegation was necessary because our markets, as the President said, are enormous. They're vast and they're ever-changing, and so close scrutiny by Congress would be impossible. So the authority was delegated to us. We have hundreds of career staff in four locations, Washington, New York, Chicago, and Kansas City. They oversee American markets for derivative trading, such as exchange-traded futures and options on wheat, corn, gold, silver, oil, natural gas, and other commodities. If you've ever seen the movie Trading Places with Eddie Murphy, those are our markets. Today, those markets include some of the world's largest trading and financial products, such as listed futures and over-the-counter swaps on rates of interest, credit default, and foreign exchange. Now, the CFTC has been in the news lately because of the regulation of the new futures on Bitcoin. You may have read or heard about that. Well, tonight I've been asked to talk about a moral approach to financial market regulation. And like John Stuart Mill, market regulators do indeed bring moral frameworks to our work, even if we don't have St. Thomas Aquinas on our commission staff. Now, of course, that work must proceed within the limits set by the Constitution, our governing statute, U.S. administrative law, the Congress, and the courts. But within those foundation stones, there is scope for regulator discretion and judgment. And that's the terrain I want to explore with you this evening. I'm not unique in being a great-grandchild of humble Europeans who immigrated to the United States in search of economic opportunity. They prospered in America's private sector-driven market economy with its free market economic incentives and emphasis on fiscal responsibility. They embraced and contributed to America's pluralist culture representative democracy and rule of law. And they absorbed and they instilled in their descendants these enlightened economic, social, and political values. Together, these values make up what is known as democratic capitalism. It's a system that is a proven success. It's not a matter of opinion, but a matter of economic fact that everywhere in the world there are free and competitive markets combined with free enterprise, personal choice, voluntary exchange, and legal protection of person and property, you will find the underpinnings of broad and sustained prosperity and human advancement. I have on my desk a valuable volume entitled The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism by the theologian Michael Novak. Novak asserts that of all the systems of political economy which have shaped our history, none has so revolutionized ordinary expectations of human life, lengthened the lifespan, made possible the elimination of poverty and famine, and enlarged the range of human choice as democratic capitalism. So let's borrow that title, democratic capitalism, to examine an ethical approach to the regulatory power over financial markets based upon these advanced economic, social, and political values. Let's think in terms of that spirit. Let's think of market regulation as something more than approach to economics, but as a set of moral injunctions. In other words, let's acknowledge that there is a moral content, moral necessity to market regulation. The first, is the golden rule. There is a reason that C.S. Lewis said that the golden rule appears in every great civilization. It's the foundation for that civilization. We should treat each other in the marketplace with the respect and the regard we want for ourselves, with business practices 
that we want for ourselves. And it's also how market regulators must treat market participants. And it's how market participants must re respond to regulation. Second, market regulation in the spirit of de democratic capitalism respects the exercise of civil freedom, the foundation of a constitutional republic. We each have inalienable rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are about the freedom of the individual, not just his or her moral and political freedom, but economic freedom as well. It's the freedom of creative choice that allows the individual to live, live a life and pursue work of his or her choosing, not chosen for him by government. Accordingly, market regulators must not limit economic freedom without serious justification. In fact, market regulators swear an oath to support and defend the US Constitution and its limited powers in the Bill of Rights. Accordingly, market regulators are duty bound to protect constitutional freedoms, including market activity, economic li liberty, and the freedom of creative choice. Third, free markets provide exercise for our civil freedom Free markets encourage innovation, productivity, job creation, better health, and human progress. But this freedom is not unlimited. It cannot be used to create monopoly, to fraud others, manipulate markets, or engage in other actions that ultimately undermine free markets. Free markets must not be exploited in ways that can destroy those same free markets. And that's where market regulators come in. Their mission of market regulation in the spirit of democratic capitalism is to prevent such exploitation. And it does so by place, placing reasonable limits on market activity. Yet any limitation on free markets must be carefully calibrated to apply tho to those activities that degrade free markets without constraining those that enhance them. Distinguishing the two must be based on careful, data-driven econometric analysis and not anecdote or political expediency. As a general approach, market regulation in the spirit of democratic capitalism must solve for demonstrable problems, not mere incidents of bad behavior. Rely on solid evidence, not assumptions. Represent an optimal approach among alternative courses of action, measure success through rigorous econometric analysis, and advance innovation and competition through flexible and technology neutral rule frameworks. Fourth, market regulation in the spirit of democratic capitalism also encourages professionalism. Qualifications matter. Job holders must be prepared for their jobs. Accordingly, market regulation should encourage high standards of market conduct and market behavior. At the same time, regulatory agencies must have funding adequate to fulfill their missions. It's a matter of public trust. It's the essence of a politics of trust. I have to share something with you. I work with some brilliant, talented people in the federal government. They're a credit to the nation. It's too easy today to mock government employees as over, underworked and overpaid and out of touch with the concerns of ordinary Americans. I spent 30 years in the private sector and the past four in the federal government. And let me tell you, my CFTC colleagues are some of the best and finest and most hardworking people I've ever worked with. And they serve this nation earnestly and well. And they're proof that American public service remains a noble calling and worth a young person's consideration. Fifth, democratic capitalism treats individuals as important by themselves and for themselves. And I want to add something from Mill. In several places, he talks about human dignity. I think he may have been the first to bring attention to that topic. Market should not exploit a worker or a trader or a market participant. Human dignity must be protected, not forgotten, 
in our regulatory efforts. In other words, people matter. They're not a number or a category or a file or a social media account. Far too much of today's media-saturated online world dehumanizes us, takes away our dignity. In a world of seven billion people and growing, each one is unique, a singular person, and must be treated that way in everything we do. And human dignity encourages thinking and education, not pro uh, uh, propaganda or dogma. This campus stands for, up for individual freedom precisely because Concordia is pledged to the true concept of education, exploration of ideas and free thought. Sadly, too few American campuses honor that pledge anymore. Conformity, rather than intellectual diversity, is the tenor of our pedagogical times. Intellectual conformity is equally anathema to democratic capitalism, healthy and dynamic markets, and the type of sound market regulation on which they depend. Sixth, democratic capitalism requires that regula regulators vigorously protect market integrity by enforcing the laws that ensure it. There must be no tolerance for fraud, deception, manipulation in financial markets. Criminality takes away our freedom for the personal gain of a few. Market regulators must maintain bulwarks against such misbehavior, protecting the markets and the American people from those who would harm them. As an agency head, the mission of legal enforcement is especially clear to me because I know from firsthand experience as a former marketplace operator that market integrity is essential to fostering robust trading and reasonable and responsible risk taking. Enforcing the law is ultimately tied to our freedom and enforcement is necessary to preserving it. Seventh, there must be fairness. Regulators must not take sides, not favor one set of market actors over another. We must be perceived as fair and just agents. Our personal and institutional character matters. And eighth and last, the markets must make us better as family members, colleagues, citizens, business people, market participants, and yes, regulators. Aristotle felt that polity, if moral, should ennoble us, make us all better. I feel that way about free and well-ordered financial markets. They must make us more virtuous and better people. Financial markets must be a source for human good, not exploitation. And that brings us back full circle to the golden rule. We must see ourselves in each other, finding a mirror that reflects our souls. There must be honesty, integrity, and reliability in our dealings with others. And we must live without fear. For those who seek it, there must be the freedom to find God in our work. Because freedom is God's gift to each of us. I'd like to leave time for questions. But before ending the lecture, I'd like to again to recall John Stuart Mill. At one point, Mill's friend and neighbor was John Austin, that lion of jurisprudence. Austin advocated that we find, in his words, the moral sense in things. And like Mill, Austin, and others, I encourage you to continue your own search for the moral sense in things. Mill felt that such a search was part of a larger inheritance in our civilization, what we give to each other and to those who follow. And I'm delighted to have been part of your search for moral sense this evening. And through our discussion tonight, you've been a part of my search as well. And all of this would have made Dr. Jacobson proud and justified his belief in the goodness of a philosophical and religious education. So with that, I thank you very much for the pleasure, and I'd be delighted to take some questions. <laughs> Uh, 
yeah, Chairman Giancarlo, thank you for those remarks. Um, the financial crisis occurred about 10 years ago, but I think its legacy lives on. In your view, did it represent the failure of democratic capitalism and free markets? And if so, what's the appropriate response? It's complicated. But um, uh, uh, something of a, um, uh, a follower of a um, MIT professor named Andrew Lowe, who has been writing on uh, what he calls the adaptive theory of markets, and it's um, it represents some of more contemporary thinking about markets. Where I think historically we thought of markets as fairly um, static creations; they're obviously moving. But, but that they should be in a constant set of motion, a very consistent set of motion, and any disturbance to it was itself a failure of markets. And under that theory, what happened in 2008 might be considered a failure. Uh, Professor Lowe posits markets that are much more like organisms in the natural world, that are always evolving, but like, like ecosystems in the natural world, sometimes can become under stress and could suffer um, uh, what seem to be highly unusual events, say, in a human lifetime, but over the course of the Earth's time are not that unusual, such as a 100-year fire um, that would wipe out a forest. And yet, in, in natural science, that fire is absolutely nece necessary to regenerate the forest. And so under Andrew Lowe's view of markets, uh, markets are always um, uh, careening from event to event, constantly evolving, but constantly self-correcting. Um, there's a lot of an antecedents to the th 2008 financial crisis. There's no question that financial in institutions bear a lot of responsibility. But there's also no question that the federal government was encouraging financial institutions to hold um, a, a higher level of what was known then as subprime or alt-A debt um, without full recognition of the risks involved in that debt. And so there were a lot of contributing factors, um, uh, and yet I believe that um, uh, the markets continue to, will continue to regenerate themselves. Um, the alternative to um, dynamic Self-correcting markets are markets where uh, humans attempt to bring a lot of uh, external control. And the, my, my personal view is those markets don't serve to advance society well. There's a, another writer, George Gilder, who I, who I follow closely, who believes that overly controlled markets, um, you, all you do is repress what would ultimately be um, a counter reaction and a, and a bigger crisis. Now, as you know tonight, from my remarks tonight, I do believe in, in market regulation, and as my role in my commercial career overseeing markets, I believe in regulation even that much more. Uh, but I do believe that uh, markets have an organic nature to it, that we uh, humans um, uh, um, are at risk of, uh, just, just as we, we, look how we struggle to get things right like levees on the Mississippi River or, or um, breakwaters on the Atlantic Ocean on the Jersey Shore or um, uh, other uh, areas in which we um, uh, try to control nature only to find that nature has a way of coming back even stronger if you control it. I find the same thing applies to markets as well. What, you have to have a respect for the power of the marketplace just as you have to have respect for the power of nature and, and, a, and a humility about our own ability to control them, uh, those, those, those natural forces. Hello, sir. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I've been a market practitioner for my entire career, and um, we're most interested in, you know, this discussion here, what you talked about, creative choice, which sort of lends us to move into the cryptocurrency space. Can you talk a little bit about that and where the CFTC is? And let's say if we're using a timeline like a baseball game, what inning will you be in as far as the regulatory environment is? We're, we're certainly in inning one or two, okay. uh, very early in this. So um, 
we're, we're a unique agency, and um, it's one of the reasons I really was excited to come to this agency. Um, because for the most part, our markets that we regulate are professional markets. They're not largely retail markets. Um, and as a result, Congress gave us a, a customer education mandate, but not a con customer protection mandate. And, and, and that matters because if markets are mostly commercial entities trading with commercial entities, one presumes that provided that, they, that there's proper disclosure, that they can bear risks. And I point that out because our sister agency is the Securities and Exchange Commission. They have a customer protection mandate, um, and they oversee markets that have a large retail component in it. So the SEC, by, um, by culture and by statute, has to worry about people getting harmed in markets. Now, we do too, but it's different. If, if, if a financial institution is trading in the market and they get their position wrong, well, they know the risks of getting involved. Well, if mom and pop and grandma and grandpa get hurt in the market, then the SEC has got different concerns. So we come at these things slightly different. I mention that because there's been a lot of commentators, especially some press that are looking for conflict, trying to uh, compare the CFTC's approach to cryptocurrency with the SEC. It's just that we institutionally come at it different. We also, our statute allows our exchanges to self-certify new products. And so two of our large exchanges, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the Chicago Board Options Exchange, certified new Bitcoin futures contracts. And so they've been launched. Um, uh, we're still, as, as I say, still very, in the very early stages of the development of this. I, I think of uh, cryptocurrency um, as something that is generational in nature. You know, um, I'm, I was born in the 1950s, at the end of the 50s, almost in the 60s. My older cousins, um, who were really ripe in the late 60s during the Woodstock generation, they saw what they were doing, music, the culture, as a cultural revolution against a, a generation older than them who, had, who in their minds had let them down in the civil rights movement, let them down in Vietnam, and they saw the cultural change that they were embarking upon as a way of um, um, changing the world. Um, what I read, as I read about a lot of the excitement about virtual currency, it reminds me, here we are 40 years later, of a similar generational change but it's not one expressed culturally, it's one expressed technolo technologically. They see um, virtual currency as a, w as a way of, in a sense, um, um, uh, taking control from the generation that brought them the 2008 financial crisis, from, from a media that they feel is out of touch with, with their communication needs, just as they communicate to each other directly through social media, so they want to transact with themselves directly through a, a medium of exchange that's not controlled by banks, not controlled by financial intermediaries. And so what I see happening in cryptocurrency, let's put aside its use as a, uh, as a financial instrument, its use as a, as a, um, as a social, as, 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 a, as a form of emergence of a new generation um, it reminds me a lot of a previous generation's use of music and sex, drugs, and rock and roll and everything else. It, it, it's a new type of generational change that I see expressed in, in this. And I, I, th I th think there's a lot of people not seeing that and therefore missing what's driving a lot of the interest in, in Bitcoin and other virtual currencies. Edward Powers, if I may, yep. uh, I'm going to ask an unfair question. Okay, so you've been talking about free markets, and I've looked a lot into the non-free markets, mainly, mainly in Russia and China. And yes, it is a global economy. And for about four years, there were a tremendous number of fires in Siberia. And the next thing, we're talking about an area the size of France between Irkutsk and Habarovsk. And then the next thing you know, is the roads into that area were closed. And it turned out that the, Vladimir Putin leased that land to China. And it's being 
populated by Chinese now in that section of Siberia. Um, last year, I had the opportunity to ask Henry Qu Kissinger the question. And his comment was, the Chinese think not in terms of 500 or 1,000 years, but millennia. And you're talking about one, what, 173 million Russians versus 1.3 billion Chinese. And they're going home. They're going to take over that land. So my question is, in the global economy, what's going on there? Why, you know, they fought a war in the 1970s. Why, why is Russia leasing that to, uh, to China? What's their strategy? What's their game plan? Thank you. Great question. And the answer is, it's simple answer is I don't know. Um, I, I will tell you there's probably some historical uh, precedent for it because uh, uh, under the czars, the Russians invited um, other nations to settle part of their land, specifically Germans in many parts. And so uh, maybe um, this is a continuation of that belief that uh, in areas that are sparsely populated by native Russians, um, that by bringing in others who might be industrious and may be able to develop that those lands, um, there may be value in it. But I'm, I'm not particularly familiar with this. I, I you, you know, with the Chinese certainly have people to spare to colonize other lands, and you know historically the Chinese have also been um, uh, great uh, developers of area. If you look at all of Southeast Asia. Um, you know, starting with some of the great uh, former British colonies like Hong Kong, um, and, but also Singapore and all the way down the, the Malay Peninsula, you find a lot of Chinese that are very, very active. So, the, you know, the Chinese have a tradition of uh, developing areas that are um, ethnically of another culture, and, and the Russians have a long tradition of inviting other cultures into their land. So maybe this is just a historical trend playing out in modern times. Thank you. Um, there's traditionally been a lot of uh, obsession about gold manipulation in the futures markets. And there was, you know, a, a, I guess, evidence of that in the banking system in Europe a couple of years ago with price fixing there. Uh, is there any evidence of that? That's question A. And then B is with the proliferation of machine learning algorithms trading in the futures markets, is it harder and harder for you to regulate it to um, see if th something is collusion, something is a simply speculation on a mass scale now compared to the, the past? Yeah, so, so two, two great questions. So uh, on gold and precious metals, um, let, me, let me point to two elements to that. It's, it's an area of uh, a lot of consumer fraud. Uh, we, we probably spend 40% uh, of our enforcement budget going after, in many cases, it's the same characters that are um, uh, pursuing precious metals scams on, um, uh, on retirees, on, on all manner of people. I mean, it, it's, I've seen some of the saddest cases in the world on precious metals and foreign exchange scams often run out of churches and, and senior homes. I mean, really bad people in this area. And we put them in jail um, as often as we can, and they come out and start doing it all over again. I mean, it's some of the worst stuff. So you please watch out for these. And you know, sadly, some of these same characters now are moving into to Bitcoin. So there is a dark side of many of these markets. So, uh, and that's a big part of what we do. Um, and notwithstanding my uh, belief in, in democratic capitalism and markets, you know, I also know that the underside of free markets are, 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 are very shady characters and a lot of fraud manipulation. Now, there are, having said that, there are um, a number of well-known uh, newsletter writers and um, um, advocates for precious metals as investments some of whom um, routinely allege of institutional market manipulation by a number of large banks. Uh, the CFTC, which is um, outstanding our statute in 1936, we were formed in 1975, 
has probably about six different times done comprehensive full studies. Most recently, about six years ago, we did a study with the Justice Department and the FBI and the Securities Exchange Commission looking into allegations of institutional large Wall Street bank manipulating precious metals and found nothing. And, and, and there was no attempt to um, short circuit this. We were determined to find out if it was going on because of a lot of these allegations. One of the things we have at the agency is very, very detailed market information, which some of these people alleging these movements don't have. So they'll see the market up one day and assume it must have been Goldman Sachs manipulating the market. Uh, well, we, we look into those allegations carefully. Once you go very, very granular in the market, we can see by, by microsecond per trade, you realize that's not the case. So um, to those who would allege that there are, is rampant institutional market manipulation, um, I can say to the best of my knowledge and analysis, there's not but we will still continue to look in every allegation because that's our job and we take it very seriously. We have a podcast series at the CFTC called CFTC Talks. And a week from Friday, we'll be releasing a podcast on allegations of market manipulation of precious metals. And I encourage you to listen to it. It will, it will re, re, go through a lot of what I've just said, but in greater detail. Um, on artificial intelligence, I, I think machine learning artificial intelligence is one of the most exciting things to come into our market. So, you know, everybody here in this room has seen in the last decade how our lives have been changed by the digitization of everything, right? The way you order a taxi cab from your phone, the way we learn, the way we download information. Um, well, no surprise, the same thing is happening in our markets. One of the great pleasures I have as chairman of the CFTC is I get to travel uh, all around the country, all around the world, meeting with people that use these markets. And I meet with, a lot of, uh, meet with a lot of farmers. And I want to tell you a story about how our world's been changed by digitization. And then I'm going to come to the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence. I was in um, uh, Bardsville, Texas, which is about an hour sa south of Dallas. And I was meeting a farmer there who was a cotton farmer. And um, I wanted to learn about his cotton production, but I also wanted to see his cotton gin, which is the place where you go and take cotton and turn it into the first stage of what will become fabrics. And we were driving out to the cotton gin along a country dusty road, and, on one, and it was early in the spring, it was April. And one side of the road was a field, and I, I was looking at the fields, thought how pretty it was, and it struck me that it had just been cut. And I said, um, that must be winter wheat. I mean, I'm from New Jersey. It's not like I really know a lot about crops. So brilliant me said that must have been winter wheat. And he said, yeah. And I said, uh, looks like it's just been cut. And he said, I cut it last night. And we're driving along, and it takes my brain a few minutes. And I said, you cut it at night? And he said, yeah, I cut it last night. And I said, in the dark? He goes, yeah. And I said, how'd you do that? He said, you want to see something cool? And he pulls his, his truck over the side of the road takes out his iPhone and gives it a couple of swipes. And he shows me a video. In the video, at first I'm looking at it, it looks all black. And then I see in the video two sets of headlights. And he explains to me that two of the headlights were his combine. A combine is, is, is a piece of equipment that cuts the grain. Riding right alongside of it is a tractor pulling a cart and the grain is being cut in the combine and then shot over into the cart. And he explained to me that the combine was being driven by GPS satellite in the pitch darkness. The tractor in the cart was being held exactly 12 inches away by vehicle telemetry. And the whole video was shot by his drone, which was in the sky, <laughs> filming it. But he and his son cut the entire field, and the whole time they were in the vehicles, but they weren't driving them because they were being driven. They were just monitoring devices inside that were measuring uh, a moisture content of the wheat and all the other conditions of the wheat. So farming, if we think about this, right? Humankind has been on this earth, what's 10 millennia, 15 millennia, 20 millennia? All that time, farming has been a daylight activity. Now, thanks to digitization, farming is now a 24-hour-a-day activity, can be done in the middle of the night by a father and his son. 
Now, let me now come to artificial intelligence. I read just last week that the John Deere company, which, op which builds these GPS-guided tractors, just bought an artificial intelligence company out of Silicon Valley that makes a drone, but it's not a flying drone. It's a drone that goes through the fields. It's three inches wide, and it's like 20 inches long. And what it does, it goes down the row of the fields, and it has a camera in it. And the camera uses photosynthesis, photosynthesizing technology to look at the weeds that are coming out of the ground, identify what kind of weeds they are, and then it's followed by another drone that carries a chemical in it geared to that weed that will spray the weed. Now, anybody, I don't know much about farming. The one thing I know is that the way we used to use insect, uh, a pesticide on crops was to take a plane and fly it over the field and spray everything, the crops, the wheat, the corn, and the weeds. Now, no pesticides on the crops anymore because they micro-target just the weeds. And they send the information up to the satellite so the satellite knows what weeds are growing in that field as opposed to another field, what it's prone to. So the world is going absolutely digital in every way. It's not just you know Uber ordering a taxi. It's everything that's happening. And in markets now, market developers are developing, this just blows my mind, bots that are digital bots that they set loose into the marketplace that will go and find out where the price is tightest, where the, where, the, where the most liquidity is by testing out orders in the marketplace. So markets are no longer human markets. So you know, I, I mentioned that our markets are the markets from the movie Trading Places with Eddie Murphy. Those pits are all closed now. I mean, it's a nice story to tell, but it's like saying that you know, my mom used to drive a 48 Buick in, in, you know, when she was in high school. I mean, you know, those markets are shut now. They're all electronic digital markets. And we're just, as a regulator, just getting our head around the changing na nature of markets. It's really, really happening fast. I think DC is in good hands with you there. Uh, I'd be very curious to know, on a daily basis, what your activities are. You talked about a staff of 800, mostly lawyers, or are they economists, um, PhD types. I'd, I'd like to know more really what the composition is there and and also the follow up on the AI. Is that, I would assume, would facilitate your supervision of all these very, I'll call them esoteric derivative swap market um, markets that you have to supervise. And um, for instance, like the manipulation of LIBOR that has gone on. I don't know if that was maybe the um, your division or another SEC that spotted that, whether AI could come in and stop that. And, um, and also, I want you to talk about, if you would, uh, briefly, the sentiment, let's say market sentiment, really, from what I saw, is very anti-business under Obama, pro-business under Trump, whatever policies, whatever public sentiment here is in a room about each of those presidents. I just you know, there is, I think, a justifiable comment to be made that perhaps things are more pro-business today. You obviously are pro-business, and so I wonder how that's influencing your activity. Sure, thank you for that. So I, um, uh, I, I resist the term pro-business, at least as far as, I, no, no, it's pro, fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the point I make is that I'm pro-markets. Always have been, always will. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly rare in Washington. I think I'm the only senior official who was uh, first appointed by President Obama, unanimously confirmed by the Senate, uh, reappointed by Trump, unanimously confirmed by the Senate. So I'm clearly not uh, upsetting enough people in Washington. And, uh, and uh, um, so, so um, I, I view myself as, as pro-markets. And if anything, I'm a little bit um, uh, pro-U.S. markets. And the reason I say I'm pro-U.S. markets is because for 150 years, we've taken our markets for granted. We've always assumed that there'll be a New York Stock Exchange owned by Americans and there'll be a Chicago Mercantile Exchange where American farmers can go hedge the risk of American crop production. Um, we should not take that for granted any longer. Um, uh, Argentinian far farmers cannot take for granted uh, that their crop is priced in Ar Argentinian peso. It's priced in the dollar. 
Um, uh, when China buys soybeans, they, they pay in dollars. When, uh, the, when the world buys copper, they pay, it's priced in dollars. That is a tremendous national advantage um, that we, we take for granted. Um, our farmers even take it for granted, and they shouldn't. Um, and, and China won't take it for granted because they're determined to see these products priced in their currency, as, as, as any great power, I would think, should. So we have to not take this for granted. So, so the reason why I'm pro-markets is because um, clearly I've, I've sworn to hold our constitution, that's my job, but because I believe that you know, it, it is part of the, the, the prosperity we enjoy in this country is part and parcel of the fact that most of the world's commodities are priced in our currency. It gives us a tremendous advantage. Um, uh, so uh, you asked about the composition of the agency. Um, uh, I'm also a supporter of the Dodd-Frank Act, at least the portions of it that relate to swaps. In fact, my background is I was a market operator for 14 years, um, built some of the world's largest trading platforms for over-the-counter swaps. Now, we were not a trading house. We just operated the platform. We, we were the exchange for things that didn't trade on an exchange. And I noted the um, shortcomings in the market structure. Um, and when the Dodd-Frank Act was passed, I, as, 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 as your president mentioned, I testified a number of times and advocated a number of the changes that went into the Dodd-Frank Act and was passed, I commended President Obama uh, for it and Congress, and that's why I think I was selected to serve by, by President Obama. Um, uh, we expanded tremendously as an agency in the rule writing process and became a very lawyer-focused agency. What I'm trying to do now is return to our historical role as more of an econometrically driven agency. As a lawyer, you know, lawyers have an important role to play. But one of the things we don't do is try to anticipate where markets are going. And uh, the great Wayne Gretzky, when he explained why he was so successful, he said, it's not because I skate to where the puck is, I skate to where the puck is going. And I think regulators, especially in markets evolving as fast as this, need to be seeing where the markets are going. And we need to become more econometrically focused so we can anticipate the development of markets. Um, and so, um, so I, I, it's a pro-market point of view. Um, uh, I believe in a balance between solid, sensible regulation, but a healthy respect for the dynamism of markets. Uh, controlled economies rarely work, and often they fail spectacularly, as in the case of Venezuela. Um, um, un uh, uh, um, regulated markets with a healthy balance of regulation often work well with, with, with periodic failures. I'll take markets that generally work well, where, gener where generations can live in general prosperity, over markets that where, there's, where, there's, where there's, it's over-controlled and often fail spectacularly, as in the case of, of Venezuela. And I'm not mean to pick on that, but just as a contemporary example of controlled markets. I'll take this gentleman, and then maybe a student will formulate one, because I'd love to have a student question. There was a comment about um, um, the former administration and uh, this administration being more pro-business. OK, that's OK, huh? um, pro-business. I like the stock market going up and my stock's going up. But I was wondering if you can comment on another thing. Um, right now, businesses have eliminated pensions. Um, they, the Republicans went in, in the tax program were, were suggesting that they take the 401 pro, program where, where people right now could contribute $18,000 tax-free and as a way of saving so that they can cut the, the taxes for business more, they were going to limit that to $5,000 for a 401k. Okay. Um, you know, this is great for business. I, you know, I, I, I see it. I admit it. Uh, and I see it getting, the stock market getting better. I was wondering if you could take a long-term approach on it, though. Right now, the percentage of saving in this country uh, is about 5%. And people, don't, um, a large majority, don't have any pensions at all. And most people um, who are even living in the New York area have trouble uh, saving for the 401k. The, the housing costs and the homeless problems is getting worse and worse. So aside from business being in a great situation, 
Uh, can you can you uh, take a look at the future where the working people and the people that are trying to earn a living after after they get a college education and come out with tremendous loans? Um, what happens to people? They can't work forever. Uh, uh, can you may, uh, look, give us a positive sure. Uh, sure. spin on this? So, so uh, I, if, if, I, what I don't want to do uh, is, is compare one administration to the other. I've served under both. And, and as an independent agency, um, uh, I, I'm uh, duty bound to stay within my lane of our commodity markets. But what I will say to this, because we have young people in the audience, and I have three young people myself is I try to say to, the, say to them the same thing my parents said to me and the same thing their parents said to them, is, is you, 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 you gotta go and build economic independence through, through saving your first dollar, through, through, you know, through showing up to work on time, to holding down a good job, to, you know, to all the things that, that, um, uh, that are, were, were the ticket to the middle class lifestyle for our forebears. I mean, I, I, my people, my, my ancestors were very humble, you know, basically former serfs and, and peasants. But, you know, they learned those middle class values of, 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 of you know, of hard work and industry and, 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 and um, um, uh, you know, of, 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 shall I say it, monogamy uh, of, of, of industry, industriousness. I mean, and, and those are the simple, and that's, you know, doesn't, life doesn't always go that way, but, but those, those are the simple virtues that I think every generation needs to practice. And, and government can do what government can do or can't do, but, but um, I, at the end of the day, it comes down to family structure, hard work. I mean, all the, the you know, they sound so pedestrian. When I was a teenager, you know, it sounded so boring, but I um, mean, you know, that was, that was months ago I was a teenager. Now I'm an adult, I mean. <laughs> And, and we, you know, we have to pass on those same values. I mean, I, I know it sounds terribly old-fashioned, but at the end of the day, um, if, if you're relying on the government to be there, it's, it's hard. Now, we all rely on it to a certain degree. We have to. There's no question about it. My mom receives her Social Security check, and she's earned it, and, and, and that's as it should be. But, um, but at the same time, those old-fashioned values are still the ones we have to pass on. And, and I say this to the young people here. Um, it, it's, it's, it's all within your grasp, it's, but it is hard work and it's discipline. I, can I hold that thought? It's, I'd love to take a student. Um, it, it's wonderful to, to have an opportunity to speak in front of young people. So having just said that comment about you know, hard work and discipline, I'm probably <laughs> turn me off, I'm sure. But. Is that a question up there? Uh, no, I wouldn't say so. So, I mean, if, if by my network you mean the commission, I mean, we're a very diverse commission, a lot of um, uh, um, uh, diverse ethnically, uh, racially, religiously, um, politically. Um, uh, I would say, though, that um, I, I think politics today is so antagonistic, it's, it's, it's like lost the plot. Um, we have to get, I mean, we have to get beyond the, you know, just viewing the, the, that our, you know, our, the biggest problem is the other party and get back to the fact that we're all in this together. Thank you. Because we are. I mean, the media we watch just, just polarizes us. You know, I work a lot with the press, and I don't mean to, to get down on the press, but Every story, you know, they call up and say, well, we'll run this story that you and your fellow commissioners are in a dogfight over this. And I said, what are you talking about? We were just at lunch. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it, you know, they're always searching for conflict in every issue. And so we then fall into that trap of thinking there's conflict in everything. And, and we have so much more together that we have to do. We've got, 
you know, roads that need to be fixed. We've got, you know, uh, pensions that need to be funded. We, we've got, you know, young people that we need to get on the right road in life. And we've got, you know, racial tension that we need to heal. We, we've got so much that we need to do. We need to come remember that we're Americans first. And, and the politics will de always be there. But I, I sometimes think, I say this, I work, you know, with a lot of folks in Washington, but I think there's got to be some people that really just want to divide us. And, and I think we need to resist that. I think we need to resist that and realize our common humanity is, is really what's, what's potentially at stake here if we don't resist that temptation. So. Ma'am. You mentioned that you wanted questions by students. Uh, I'm not one here. But I wonder what you can advise them because the most valuable companies on the stock market were great disruption. And we watched their rise mostly through intellectual things. And so jobs disappeared. So someone's in college now. What can you tell them to keep an eye on to hopefully anticipate or notice what the disruption is so you can make that course change? And you can go into the area that has jobs, that's expanding, that hasn't lost jobs, but are never coming back. Yeah, it's a great question. It, and it's so hard to know. Who knew, you know, back in that big tech bubble of 2000, which of those companies would survive and become the great companies today in which, you know, so many of them failed. And um, the same is happening now. I, you know, we talked about Bitcoin. Who remembers Netscape Navigator, right? Gone like the dodo bird, right? Replaced by, I mean, who knows? Yeah, who, who knows what a dodo bird is, right? <laughs> But, you know, Bitcoin may turn out to be the Netscape navigator of cryptocurrencies and it may move, or it may, it may turn out to be the survivor. We don't know. The one thing I do believe is, though, that technology always destroy, destroys jobs, but I think it always creates them, too. So, so you know, the, the, the classic example is every town in America had three blacksmith shops back when we used horse transportation. Well. Clearly, internal combustion engine, the automobile, destroyed that whole industry. But then every, every town had five gas stations, you know? And so technology always leads to new and different jobs. And so that's why it's so important to young people to become lifelong learners, which I also know is a virtue taught here. You've got to be lifelong learners. In your lifetime, you're not going to just go through five or six jobs. You're going to go through five or six professions. You're going to go through five or six different intellectual disciplines. And so it's whatever, you know, of course, train for your first job because you want to land that first job. But, but go into it thinking about how do I keep learning? How do I keep preparing myself for what's coming next? Because what you may do when you leave here probably won't be what you're doing a decade later. So you've got to take the lessons of, being, of how to learn with you throughout the course of your lifetime. On that thread, what, uh, what have you read recently, whether you know, a book or a periodical that has sort of opened your mind to that uh, concept? George Gilder's uh, uh, Knowledge and Power, 2013. Brilliant book. Um, uh, and he talks about, it, it's really fascinating, but he talks about using technology evolution as a basis for thinking about your own intellectual evolution. So, so you think about uh, like a, a software like Microsoft Word or, 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 or um, uh, uh, OS X for, for um, Apple. And in, in, the, in the world of development of software, once you create a core work, you're always updating it. You're always thinking ahead of what's the next evolution of it. And he talks about that being a framework for our own education as we develop a core framework, like a core operating system but we've always got to be updating that operation system for new applications that come along. It's a fascinating way of thinking about our own intellectual development. George Gilder, excellent work.